first of all i thank you for patiently waiting uh, for all the speakers and but you also got the opportunity to listen to so many diverse voices uh, for those who are not familiar many have heard uh, in the pakistani diasporas in the pakistani intelligentsia the name of ryan grim his publication uh, which is i consider one of the most important voices of the global south within united states uh, mm -hmm. and i would like to sit down Uh, with Ryan Grimm to understand the dynamics that control the U.S. media, how the narratives shape over here. Uh, Ryan uh, uh, is now the bureau chief of this important publication, Intercept in Washington D.C. Before this, he had been the bureau chief of another very important publication uh, in United States, Huffington Post, which is known worldwide. Uh, the Intercept has written extensively on Pakistan. In fact, uh, many efforts which we have done through our social media pale into insignificance. The three or four stories that came into uh, from the Intercept. Uh, have made the U.S. establishment on defensive. They actually were compelled to answer back, and uh, it was a huge impact inside Pakistan across the world as well. Uh, Ryan is also an author of more than one book. I just got his latest book on the squad, which is the left side politics of the Democratic Party. Uh, Ryan, you have heard everyone. Uh, my question is this: What is the way forward? You know, and uh, uh, and what is the significance of the uh, cipher gate for which Imran Khan is facing a form of a death penalty? And what is the way forward between the United States and between the people of Pakistan and Imran Khan? I, th I think the, your last speaker uh, said it well, is that the, the West uh, may, may say a lot of things about the values that it holds, uh, but what it understands uh, is, is power. And uh, until, uh, until Pakistan, you know, inside Pakistan and also over here, in the in the united states with a with an organized uh lobby that forces uh that forces washington to pay attention to uh pakistani americans uh it, it will you know pakistan will be kind of at just at the at the whim of of global powers uh you, you and i were on capitol hill a week or two a week or two ago and i i mentioned that there's a kind of famous saying in washington uh that that says If if you're not at the table, uh, you're on the menu. And right now, you know, Pakistan, when it comes to global affairs and also in in Washington, uh, is is on the menu. And we we talked yesterday about the way that democracy represents such a kind of significant threat, uh, both to you know domestic elites and and also to people, also to other countries around the world that want to manipulate. Uh, the internal politics of of a country, and you know, for the, for their own interests, there was a the, a paper that came out recently, you know, drawing a direct connection between Pakistan's anemic economic growth over the last many decades, and and Pakistan's lack of democracy because uh, because people in Pakistan uh, have so little power, uh, they're they're not able to kind of force elites to reckon with their own failures. When when elites are are able to go unchecked, uh, essentially what they do is they just you know extract wealth from the public, and subsidize uh, their own kind of captured monopolistic companies, which uh, are, are run counter to the innovation that any economy needs uh, to grow. And it but it is really and a lot of people understand that phenomenon, but what they don't understand is the is the connection uh, to democracy. It is empowering you know regular people. Uh, that allows you to create that kind of dynamic, you know, functional, vibrant society. And without it, you get kind of what what you have now. Similarly, uh, you know, with without a, a kind of democratic will, you know, able to kind of express itself in the country, uh, countries like the United States are then, you know, uh, it, it becomes just so much easier for them to just uh, push push people around as they as they did, you know, in uh, in March 2022. So, but what is the way forward? What would you suggest? Because we so, expect some, yeah. You're a yeah, Washington so, insider, and not only with Intercept, with Huffington Post, you know, a publication I've been, I've been, uh, I've been reading and reviewing for the past more than 10 years. How would you suggest? I mean, what is the way forward for us? So, what what the way forward is in Pakistan itself, I will leave to all the rest of your uh, to your speakers and to everyone in in Pakistan, and I and I hope that they. You know, have a genuine opportunity to set the way forward. What I what I can speak to, you know, with some experience is is what works here in in Washington D.C. And you know, what, one one anecdote I think uh, puts puts all of this into context. So, uh, around ten uh, days or so, a week and a week to ten days after uh, the invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
uh, Don Liu, the, the famous Don Liu, uh, was, was brought before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, which is the, the major committee that basically you know, provides oversight on U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Don Liu, in, at that hearing, was called to the carpet. He was chastised by one of the most well-respected, if not the most well-respected Democratic senator when it comes to foreign policy, Chris Van Hollen. And, and what Lou was hit for was not doing the diplomatic work ahead of the invasion and not speaking to the Pakistani government to try to win that, to win the Pakistani government, to win Imran Khan over to the kind of Ukrainian side. You know, it's, it's one thing if a, that if a diplomat, you know, tries and fails, but what Don Lou was getting yelled at for was just completely overlooking Pakistan. And so Don Liu was at the hearing complaining because just the day before uh, Imran Khan had been at a rally and said, you know, telling the European Union, we're not, we're not your slaves. We're going to remain neutral in this, in this conflict. And so Don Liu is complaining about that. But Senator Chris Van Hollen was responding and saying, well, what did you do? You know, what, this is also your responsibility. You, you need to be in dialogue with these countries. And so he was publicly humiliated. It was only then a couple days later uh, that he had his famous slash infamous meeting uh, with uh, Ambassador Assad Khan, in which he, you know, told uh, told Khan that all would be forgiven if Imran Khan, you know, was ousted in in a vote of no confidence. What you can see in that anecdote is that this, you know, fairly mid level um, diplomat, after he was called to the carpet, after he was yelled at by the United States Senate, felt like you know he had the ability, he had the power. To to take out take out that beating on the Pakistani ambassador, and what that shows is that he did not have any fear that there would be a a push back in the other direction. I've spoken to a lot of State Department officials uh, who have worked on the question of Israel Palestine for many decades. Uh, they know that they are on a very very tight leash, and and they they are aware that if they push too hard. Uh, against an Israeli suggestion uh, that Ron Dermer in particular, uh, but other high level Israeli officials can just pick up the phone and, you know, call the, the secretary of state and say, so-and-so uh, is, is get, is getting a little bit, uh, is getting a little bit too aggressive. You need to rein them in. You need to check them. And that can be, that can be career ending for a diplomat. You, you did not have any fear from Don Liu in that meeting that what he was saying, you know, could remotely cause him problems in his career down the road. And as you've seen, it, it did not cause him any problems. And so, and so I think the Pakistani American community needs to develop the kind of power in Washington that at least would make somebody like Don Liu think in the back of his mind, if I do this, on the one hand, there's this force, there's on the other hand, there's this power center. And so I need to balance that. So, Ryan, uh, it's so interesting, you know, and for many other people who are not familiar with this, I mean, you have actually brought the real thing that how Donald Liu and his team were not able to, were simply not cognizant of the fact that they needed to approach the government of the Prime Minister Imran Khan, and they never approached him before. So they failed in their professional responsibility. Now, adding to this, I can share with you that before Imran Khan as Prime Minister went on to Russia, uh, he invited um, a large meeting in Islamabad. I mean, he always used to do this. I mean, he was a man of public input. Mm -hmm. And in the meeting, he called all the ex-ambassadors who had served in Russia. And this meeting was just one day before he took off. He took off in the evening, I think on 23rd or something, uh, for Moscow. Uh, and on 22nd or in, in, in the same morning, there was a meeting in the morning. In the, in the, in, on the day in which he left for Russia, in, in, one day before, uh, he had a meeting and he called all the ex-ambassadors uh, of Pakistan that has served in, uh, in Moscow mm -hmm. and all the ex-foreign secretaries, including the current foreign secretary. At that time, it was Mr. Suhail Mahmood. Uh, he had called uh, several other people. Uh, and, and there were so many other you know, people. And there were three journalists. I was one of them, I think, and Piaz Gul was the other. And one single question he kept on the table for everyone was this. He said, look, gentlemen, uh, we had strained relationship with Russia. Uh, there is a Russian invitation which was pending for the past several months. It kept on delaying for several reasons. But now at a time when we are supposed to go to the Russia, we were so, and also keep in the mind that he was supposed to go to the Russia uh, in the beginning of February. 
but that trip was rescheduled because of the Winter Olympics. Because the Winter Olympics in Beijing were boycotted by the Western countries, led by United States. Uh, so uh, the, the Pakistani trip to Moscow was rescheduled because the Pakistani leadership and the Russian leadership both had to go to the Winter, Winter Olympics. Otherwise, the Pakistani visit would have taken between the 1st and the 3rd or the 5th February uh, of 2022. But in this meeting, which is a historic meeting, and I dovetail it with what you tell, Imran Khan asked everybody to basically think on this and tell us, should I go to Moscow at this time because I fear that the war is impending, the scenario is that the war. So everyone in that room, including all ex-ambassadors, diplomats, the foreign secretary, the ex-foreign secretaries and the journalists, none of the Pakistani people had the slightest cognizance and understanding of the European and the Western sensitivity on the issue of Ukraine. All they were basically possessed is that if we didn't go uh, to Moscow at this time, we always had strained relationship. We have worked for the past 10, 15 years through the Druzba commando exercises and so many contacts across, you know, uh, the world with the Russians and Chinese have helped with us. If we didn't go to Moscow at the time, uh, Putin would be upset and our relationship with Russia uh, would have a setback. So there were total disconnect. And I am just basically connecting the two dots because what you tell from the Washington perspective and what I'm telling you from Islamabad perspective is it was an utmost failure on the part of the team of the Secretary, uh, Secretary uh, Bill Clinton, uh, sorry, Blinken, uh, Tony Blinken and, uh, uh, and Donald Liu, that they never took, had, had the American government approached the Prime Minister Imran Khan's team at the highest level, they were told us that, they, look, there are reservations, you shouldn't really go to Russia at the time. There was absolutely no possibility. So, so much so that Imran Khan told his audience that I have also checked with the Pakistani military chief and the military was of the firm view, General Bajwa was of the firm view that he should go and he said, we will explain to the American side so Iran Khan was the only one who was worried that how the Americans and the West are going to react to it. And subsequently, he also told the journalists after the visit that just before leaving, he again called the army chief, General Bajwa, and he said, look, the war looks totally imminent. Should we go and should we not go? And the army chief again and the intelligence said to him that you should go. So I think this perspective itself has never been uh, has never been understood over here. So what would, would, would you your thoughts? I would just make you, uh, I request you to make some comments on it and then we can move ahead. That, that's a fascinating point because I wonder, uh, it, it, you know, if there were reservations express, expressed from the United States, they would have been, you know, through the national security team and they would have been sent and the military would have been aware. It raises a, a fascinating question of whether or not he was set up, uh, whether or not Bajwa actually did know um, that that this was a a red line um, for for the United States uh, and and encouraged him to go anyway because he knew you know what you know what what this you know the the effect that this would have uh, but also that 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 does not excuse the State Department that does not excuse the diplomats uh, their their obligation to just do do the basic point you you can argue that you know Khan should you know Khan should do whatever he wants but he would he should do it you know, fully aware uh, from every perspective of what the kind of geopolitical Im implications are. If he understands this is a red line for the United States and he says, well, we're, we're sovereign and we've got this meeting scheduled and we're going to go anyway, then great, more, more power to him. But he should, he should be, you know, he should have that, he should have that information. He, he was never warned. But my last question before I, I let you go, uh, Ryan, uh, 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 while this is important, whatever happened between Donald Liu and all this, I had a lot of access to the diplomatic community, uh, the Western diplomatic community, also the Indian uh, diplomatic community in Islamabad because I was a publisher. My publication was going to all the diplomatic missions. It was a substantive publication, the magazine, the Global Village Space magazine. I had started feeling this thing uh, as early as 2021, the beginning, uh, when the Biden administration took hold on the 20th January. After 20th January, I started sensing this thing, uh, that something is happening, and I kept on hearing this thing, uh, that Imran Khan is not getting the bigger picture. He doesn't understand us. He's a sort of a nuisance. He's very rigid. Imran Khan has to go. Uh, he is going to be in the dustbin of the history. He's not acceptable. I heard these statements from the Western diplomats and also from the Indian diplomats. And I also heard this thing that General Bajwa is the man who's going to deliver for peace in South Asia. He has delivered for the ceasefire. So where does the Donald Liu's uh, reaction, uh, uh, which you have just mentioned, his failure becomes important. I think uh, the idea to get rid of the Imran Khan 
was being incubated for quite some time. Your, your thoughts on it? That's how, that, that lines up with uh, everything that we've learned about the situation. Uh, and so, uh, no, I, I think, I think all, all of that fits with our, with our understanding of it. And it fits with what we were talking about earlier that the, the, and the United States priority by that point was, uh, you know, was U Ukraine and Russia up here and then everything else, you know, way, way down below where you can't even see. And so um, w when that, when those situations arise, um, the, the U.S. is very quick to make, um, you know, very, very, you know, major decisions quickly. Uh, so, but I, I, I think you're right that 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 it was headed that it was headed in that direction bef before that. And, and there might be some relationship between you know uh, his his good relationship with Donald Trump. It's it's an, it's ironic that you know a a country can be punished by one American administration for having good relations with a different. Um, uh, ad administration, you know, a as if the uh, navigating the relationship wasn't difficult enough already. So just, I mean, it's getting longer. I know it's getting longer, but just one last uh, a very interesting piece of information I wanted to share with you because you mentioned Jake Sullivan's national security uh, team. When Imran Khan and the Pakistani delegation had arrived in Moscow uh, and they were in a hotel uh, next to Kremlin, in the morning at 5 a.m. in the Moscow morning, Jake Sullivan calls the Pakistani NSA, Dr. Mui Yusuf, which I found out from the prime minister's team uh, subsequently. And Jake Sullivan demands from, and by the time the Russia had already in the early morning attacked Ukraine formally, which was in fact a huge, uh, I think a huge betrayal uh, on the part of Putin that was very clandestine, devilish and diabolical that he made Pakistani prime minister into Moscow uh, and then he basically took, the, he could have delayed that attack one day later, two days later. But Jake Sullivan called Dr. Moid Yusuf, who was sleeping then, and asked him to go back to take the Pakistani delegation. I mean, it was one hell of a command. Mm. Uh, and asked, mm. uh, you know, one, one command from the Ten Commandments and asked the Pakistani Prime Minister to go back to Islamabad. So Moid Yusuf, I have been told, comes up in his shorts and, you know, he starts knocking at the door of the uh, military secretary. He starts waking up the other people. And they all assemble uh, in the in the room uh, in the hotel room uh, of Prime Minister Imran Khan, and they said Jake Sullivan and the American government wants us to go back. And Imran Khan looks at the window and he draws the curtain and he took the Russians were marching, they were preparing for the guard of honor for the Pakistani side. And he said, "Guys, we are not stuck. We can't go back at this point. You know, it's simply not possible. I mean, if coming not coming not coming here." Uh, would have been, you know, a, a problem. But I mean, now leaving like this, you know, would have been a total slap on the face of the Russians. So he said, now we cannot go back uh, at this point. I just want to share this with you, Ryan, but thank you so much for joining yeah. us. I mean, you've been very patient uh, and I look forward to getting in touch with our own discussion on the American media. So I yeah. think with this... No, those, are, those are incredible details. Yeah, I what mean, a, we must, what a we must situation. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ryan.